Welcome everyone to this first live streamed panel of the University of Oregon's 10th Annual Undergraduate Research Symposium. I'm Paul Pepys, Professor of English and Director of the Oregon Humanities Center at U of O. Our panel, titled Oh the Humanities, features six of this year's Humanities Undergraduate Research Fellows. The HERF program is a competitive fellowship program in which selected undergraduate, undergraduates produce a substantial original research project in the humanities with the help of a faculty mentor. The HERF program is supported by the Office of the Vice President of Research and Innovation and administered by the Undergraduate Research Opportunity Program and the Oregon Humanities Center. Two other HERF fellows will be presenting later today at 1.30 on the third live streamed panel, Pens and Clicks Are Mightier Than the Sword. I hope you'll join us for that one as well. Before I turn to our fellows uh, on this panel who will introduce themselves and their projects, I'll explain briefly our format. After their introductions, our fellows will give their presentations in turn. After all of the presentations are completed, we'll have a question and answer period in which the fellows and I will ask uh, questions of the others. I know it'll be a fascinating uh, session and let's turn now to our panelists for their introductions. Good morning, my name is Caitlin Jones. I'm a senior in the art history program here at the University of Oregon. The title of my research is All Surface and No Soul, John Singer Sargent's Portraits of Modern Mannequins. Hi everyone, my name is Ryan Cooper. I'm an English major um, senior here at the University of Oregon. And the title of my project is A Girl and Her Shadow, Constructions of the Monstrous Non-Binary in Jordan Peele's Us. Hi all, um, my name is Gracia. I'm a junior here at the UO and I'm a sociology and women's gender and sexuality studies double major. And the title of my project is She's Straight But She's a Dyke, Sexuality Discourse on the Lesbian Lands. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Tucker Ingle. I'm a fourth year English major and my title of my research is The Experience of Hyper Objects from Percy Shelley to the 21st Century Instagram User. And then is Daisy here or is it me? Uh, Daisy is actually in the uh, attendee room. Okay. Jessica, will you put her into I'm the here. panelist room? Um, I'm Momo Wilmscrow. I'm a senior this here at UBO is being also. Recorded. Um, I'm a political science major and an international studies minor. And my title of my project is Desde Abajo Como Semilla, Puerto Rican Food Sovereignty as Embodied Decolonial Resistance. Okay, Daisy, you're up. Hi, uh, my name is Daisy Berkey. I'm a fourth year history major, and the title of my project is The Incomplete Male, Ideas on Femaleness and Control in Classical Greek Medical and Philosophical Texts. Great, well, let's move to our presentations. Caitlin, you're up. Thanks, Paul. Okay, let's get into my share screen. And it looks like we're having a little bit of an issue with that. And it says it's disabled. So if I could get permission, that'd be great. Still not seeing permissions for screen sharing. There we go. OK, great. Okay, can everyone see that and hear me all right? Yes. Great. Okay. So as was stated earlier, my research is titled All Surface and No Soul, John Singer Sargent's Portraits of Modern Mannequins. And the inspiration for this project really stemmed from a trip I took to London last summer, where I was first introduced to Sargent's portraits um, and the masterworks that he's produced. Through my analysis of Sargent's portraits of women in particular, I noticed a strange rigidity and superficiality in the posing of his female sitters. And um, it's a quality that through my research I've noticed is present in the writings of his contemporaries as well. And so with this research, I aim to contextualize this curious aspect of Sargent's uh, portraits with the anomalous turn of the century interest in the mannequin. From the mid 19th century on, 
uh, the mannequin becomes a common motif within goods displays throughout Paris, London, and New York. But it's not just the fashion industry that sees this, what Jane, refer, Jane Monroe refers to as an outing of the mannequin. Our artists as well um, as Sargent are including these longtime manipulable assistants in genre scenes and portraits. So through analyzing Sargent's uh, studio practices, the writings of critics, sitters, and friends, as well as this 19th century interest in the mannequin, I will demonstrate the visual and commercial similarities between Sargent's portraits of women and modern mannequins. And this research has a lot to owe to uh, Jane Monroe's seminal exhibition, Silent Partners, Artists and Mannequin, From Function to Fetish, which was exhibited at the Fitzwilliam Museum in 2014. And it's the first extensive history into the relationship between the artist and the mannequin. We'll begin with the easiest point of comparison between the mannequin form and Sargent's sitter. And to do that, we'll look to their memoirs and how they describe their role within Sargent's studio. Starting here with Lady Spire, uh, she remembers that she brought trunk loads of her nicest gowns to Sargent's studio. And after trying them on all day, none of them uh, were to Sargent's liking and he actually sent her home to fetch more, ultimately landing on this white gold brocaded slip. So in the end, it wasn't even a dress that he chose, but rather a sort of nightgown. We see a similar story arising from Mrs. Joseph E. Widener's biography, when she also laid out her nicest worth dresses before Sargent. And what he ultimately ended up choosing for her portrait was a torn dress of blue velvet that Mrs. Widener had only kept to turn into seat cushions. And as Sargent pinned the dress back together for her portrait, her son remembers that he looked as if he were, quote, a Paris courtier about to dress a mannequin before an opening, end quote. And we see this exact same word used by uh, Mr. Isaac Newton Phelps Stokes, who we see here on the right. He remembers that his wife was, quote, like treated like a mannequin, end quote, during their double portrait for Sargent. So we see this particularity that Sargent has um, in controlling the wardrobes of his female sitters, as well as this, mo this idea of motion and displaying the dress before the, before the artist in the studio. And this actually starts pretty early in Sargent's career. Ellen Terry's Lady Macbeth dress, when, it's, when it was debuted in December of 1888, immediately captured Sargent's uh, imagination and attention. The dress was actually hand-woven with the wings of hundreds of iridescent beetles. Um, so it was a very unique dress. And the movement really appealed to Sargent's impressionist style. He wrote to his friend, Isabella Stewart Gardner, that next January that, quote, Miss Terry has just come out in, in Lady Macbeth and looks magnificent in it, but she still has not made up her mind to let me paint her in one of the dresses until she is quite convinced that she is a success. From a pictorial point of view, there can be no doubt about it, magenta hair, end quote. And the reason I've italicized and underlined a portion of this quote is because I want to emphasize its importance. Sargent does not suggest that Ellen Terry is magnificent or that her performance was magnificent, but rather that she looks magnificent in it. All of the emphasis in his letter to his friend is on the dress itself. And it's something that even Terry notes in her memoirs, and she describes a studio practice very similar to those of those later sitters that we've already looked at. She remembers that, quote, he liked the swirl of the dress. He used to make me walk up and down his studio until I nearly dropped in my heavy dress, end quote. And unlike the later sitters of Sargent who describe a very similar studio practice, we actually have an early oil sketch of Ellen Terry's um, original uh, portrait. And it's really trying to capture that movement that uh, we see Sargent trying to have uh, Terry imitate in his studio. But we'll see that it's ultimately abandoned for a more, much more uh, stationary pose. And this act of walking back and forth within the studio to demonstrate the movement of clothing is what we as a 21st century audience would associate with the runway or fashion modeling. But to the 19th century audience, that's not the uh, terms that we would have used. Rather, it's a lot more accurate in the way that Sergeant Sitters are, are describing it as akin to a mannequin. And what 
The mannequin is something we associate with inanimacy now, but the living mannequins were actually um, young working class women that were recruited by shops and dressmakers. And the display tactic was actually popularized by dressmakers like Charles Frederick Worth and Lady Duff Gordon, who went by Lucille. And they would try on dresses for upper class women and customers within stores to demonstrate the movement of the dresses. But the man, the reason we wouldn't refer to it as modeling quite yet is because to a 19th century audience, uh, modeling for an artist was heavily associated with modeling the body. And they were bodies commissioned to help artists paint anatomy, uh, faces, nudes, hands. Um, and so it's not quite the word we would use, but rather the sitter describe it perfectly when they remember being akin to a mannequin. And even Terry herself in her memoirs uh, places all of the emphasis on the dress over her own body when she writes, one of Mrs. Nettles' greatest triumphs was my Lady Macbeth dress, which she carried out from Mrs. Common's car's design. I'm glad to think it is immortalized in Sargent's picture, end quote. And so we have here that she suggests that not herself or her performance is immortalized, but rather her dress is in this portrait. And so uh, this leaves Terry, like the anonymous girls of Maison Lucille, uh, buried beneath the celebrity of a dress. And so we see this role of a living mannequin within Sargent's studio. But if we look at the adjectives used to describe the formal portraits of Sargent's sitters, we see a mannequinesque quality emerge as well. Mrs. Fanny Watts, who was uh, Sargent's first entry to the Paris Salon of 1877, was actually described as pleasantly unsettling and like a coiled spring. Mrs. Henry White was described as hard. The painting is almost metallic. Mrs. Cecil Wade had, one critic had to write, quote, Mr. Sargent's portrait of a lady in white satin suggests that her arms and face were made of cardboard, end quote. And this isn't even the harshest among them. That actually belongs to the New York Times Review in 1888, who wrote, quote, it is all surface and no soul with most of Mr. Sargent's portraits. And the fault must lie with him, not with his sitters, for it can hardly be that all of them are as flinty and impudent of character as they appear. But this comparison between the modern woman and the mannequin is not exclusive to the discussion of Sargent's works. Um, there's an, a 19th century extensive fascination with the human facsimile. We see an increased production of automatons, mannequins, uh, dolls, as well as doppelgangers and interest in wax museums throughout the entire century. And artists alongside Sargent are actively participating in this. Uh, Trebner, Boldini, as we see John Ferguson Beer here on the left and Edgar Degas on the right, all have works that stage their silent partners among their living companions. And Sargent himself participated in this exposure in his oil sketch of 1891 titled Mannequin in the Snow, where he makes it very evident that this is not a human form, but a mannequin when he includes the stand in the portrait. He focuses on the drapery of this figure, the shifting color of the fabric, as well as the texture of the landscape behind it. And he really emphasizes that this is simply a clothes horse, a tool for the artist. And we see the mannequin emerge in literature, caricature, photography, as well as psychology in the turn of the century. In Ernst Gensch's On the Psychology of the Uncanny in 1906, he actually uses the human facsimile as an example of a provocateur of the uncanny sensation. To Gensch, the uncanny is the doubt as to whether an apparently living being really is animate. And conversely, doubt as to whether a lifeless object may in fact be animate. Henry James uses this precise word to describe Sargent's work when he calls his work, quote, a slightly uncanny spectacle, end quote. And so in my research, I suggest that when the critics are reviewing uh, Sargent's portraits of women with these harsh critiques of hard metallic cardboard, they're actually experiencing this uncanny sensation where they're doubting as to whether Sargent's patrons are truly animate beings. 
And so Sergeant Sitters not only acted as living mannequins within the studio space, and in their formal portraits were represented with stiff qualities that were call a mannequin form, but if you think about how the portrait and the mannequin function within their respective sales environments, they have a lot of similarities in that uh, right as well. Both the display mannequin and the po portrait, whether in the gallery or the shop window, have an idealized female form, often dressed in, a, in the latest mode of dress. And they both act as advertisements for the successful portraitist and the retailer. And so the aim of this research is not to suggest that Sargent uh, could not paint his sitters in a lively fashion or that he dehumanized them in some way. Rather, it's an example of how Sargent was set apart from the traditional Grand Manor style portraiture and was set within the visual vocabulary of the 19th century. If we note the stiffness and anonymity noted by his contemporaries, as well as his studio practices, it shows a participation in this 19th century fascination with the mannequin, as well as a demonstration of the ch changing display tactics used by the fashion industry. Sargent was a virtuoso painter with a deep passion for his craft, but a waning interest in a genre he came to dominate. For Sargent, portraiture became just an opportunity to explore uh, style on the surface of a canvas in a subtle but highly marketable way. For Sargent, it is all soul, or it is all surface, but the soul is in the paint, not the painted. I would just like to thank uh, Dr. Nina Amsitz, who is my research advisor, and Dr. Erica Hersler of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston for all of her advice, as well as everyone associated with the Oregon Humanities Center and friends, families, and family and colleagues who had to listen about Sargent and Mannequins uh, for almost a year. So thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much, Caitlin. That was a fascinating uh, paper. Our next panelist is Ryan Cooper. Thank you so much, Caitlin. That was really great. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to my project and I will share my presentation. All right. All right, so today I'm here to talk to you about non-binary representation in the film Us, um, namely to consider uh, the gendered implications of the monstrous on the screen in this film and how those implications change if we're to shift ideas about what gender can embody. So in thinking about how I wanted to approach this project, it was really about um, taking a lot of different studies and putting them all together in an interdisciplinary way. I combined queer and trans scholarship with film theory and critical race theory in order to ask questions about how the monstrous was constructed on the screen. And with that, I engage with theoretical um, research and film criticism from the last 20 years that have used feminist um, approaches to reading horror, and I've thought about how I can complicate and understand those um, through this queer and trans lens and through this lens of critical race theory. And finally, I use us as a primary text in order to ask questions about the gendered monstrous constructions and apply the kind of information and engagement with the theory that I'm looking at. So when thinking about the monstrous construction on horror film, I keep coming back again and again to this quote by Jeffrey Jerome Cohen. It's a quote that I first saw in my um, Foundations of the English Major class, and it says that the monstrous body is pure culture, the construct in a projection, the monster exists only to be read, the monstrum is etymologically that which reveals, that which warns, a glyph that seeks a hierophant. Like a letter on the page, the monster signifies something other than itself. And I think this idea of monster as cultural signifier was incredibly important to the theorists that I read. They used this language of monster as culture and monster as a way to consider how we might think about gendered relations in horror. But they did so primarily through a binary lens. 
And when I say binary and I use that language, what I'm talking about is a language of either or. I'm talking about being able to choose only between male and female as a gender identity and nothing else. Queer scholars like Ricky Wilchin states that this language of either or really restrains our language of being and becoming. And with that binary gender and the structure that only allows binary gender really doesn't allow full gender variance. When thinking about what that means, really gender and bi binary gender is saying what can't be binary gender and what can be binary gender. This means that binary gender structure defines what proper girlhood and boyhood is through performance. And when we think about how that gender is created, how that binary is structured and reinforced, we can turn to scholars like C. Riley Storton who contend that these definitions and performances are inherently racialized in the way that they're created. They're informed through a history of chattel slavery that said that certain people can be human and certain people can be deemed by the law as viable people and that others can't. This idea also builds off of Priscilla Oson's idea that girlhood as a construct depends on white innocence. That when we talk about girlhood, we're really talking about white girlhood a lot of the time. And that this idea really liminalizes black girlhood. It creates a liminal black girlhood space. And it also doesn't allow variances that non-binary might. So this term non-binary, when I say that, what I'm really talking about is questioning the established categories of being and offering possibility. When we look at these options here in this gender checker, um, we can see that this language of non-binary as well as language outside of just women and men allows us to consider different ways of being and different possibilities, often that are already there. This is really important to me as somebody who identifies as non-binary and who goes through life thinking about ways that I am um, outside of the categories of man and woman. And really what I wanna underline here is that non-binary experience is not just one story or one thing, but it's a multitude of things. And when we use that language, it's allowing variance both in the performances of binary gender and non-binary gender. And as a side note, I'd like to say that I use non-binary gender in place of genderqueer here because it allows the variance and multitude of experience to be connoted, where genderqueer is often couched in white academia and used to connote certain political active um, actions and stances that work to transgress um, binary. So I think that this idea of intentional transgression is not necessarily what I wanna say about non-binary. It's really about intentional or unintentional transgression. It's being transgressed because it's being put into this place of other. But it's also its place that has its own meaning. It's a place that may exist outside of man and woman. And it's a language that allows us to read wider. So when we think about that and we think about how um, that really affects our viewing, I came to the films that I watched through this lens asking how is the monstrous visually constructed in terms of gendered category? How does the monstrous reinforce or refuse gendered normalcy? And how does the creation of gendered normalcy affect characters' bodily performance and stylization? So in thinking about that, I'd like to turn to the film Us. Us follows Addie, played by Lupita Nyong'o, as she meets her doppelganger at a carnival when she's a child, and then as a fully fledged, respectable adult, where Addie and her family are terrorized by a whole family of doppelgangers. At the head of this family is the ringleader, Red, and Red is the direct opposite of Addie, also played by Lupita Nyong'o. Red then became the way for me to look at monstrous construction in the movie Us, and a way for me to understand how gendered relations might be working in this film. I think this film was incredibly important to look at, especially because of its cultural relevance right now. Domestically, Us grossed $255.2 million at, a, at the box office, which puts it next to It Chapter 2 in the charts and makes it the top grossing original horror screenplay of 2019 in the US. So I think that this kind of points to its cultural relevance and the reason that Red is a way for us to think about how gendered constructions and gendered attitudes might work. 
So with that, I turn to us and I ask, how was the monstrosity created in terms of body language of movement? How are Red and Addie's engagement with ideas of gendered normalcy created through narrative? And what is the difference between Red's stylization and Addie's stylization? And how does Red, as a doppelganger, in her stylization, create an othered mode? So with that, I turn to the first scene in Us that I looked at. Um, this scene is a monologue that Red provides to the Wilsons, Addie's family, and to Addie herself. And through it, we see a clear connection between the two of them. Um, Red's body's language in this scene, it mirrors Addie, but her styling is off as we can see in these frames. So with their position and the blocking of the frame, both Red and Addie are at the center of the film. Here we can see Red to the left and Addie to the right. They have their sons to, at their respective sides and they're both looking ahead. So clearly they're filmically linked. I think what's interesting about this is that their styling is different. Where Red styling might be seen as off, we can look at her unintentionally styled hair where um, her hair points out instead of Addie's intentionally styled hair, we can look at her costuming, which is a red jumpsuit that might connote incarceration in federal prison, or just not necessarily um, working towards binary representations of what costuming and clothing can look like in that it isn't feminine. It's also important that red has no makeup, that her eyebrows appear singed, and that Addie has non-singed eyebrows with a full face of makeup, or at least fuller makeup than Red does. So I think that this kind of stylization is clearly showing that while Red mirrors Addie, she cannot fully be Addie. She can't fully embody what Addie is as woman. And this is further reinstated through Red's narration at this time, which underlines what it means to become a girl. Red starts this monologue by saying, once upon a time, there was a girl and the girl had a shadow. The two were connected, tethered together. So whatever happened to the shadow, the, um, so whatever happened to the girl happened to the shadow. When the girl ate, her food was given to her warm and tasty. But when the shadow was hungry, she had to eat rabbits raw and bloody. It goes on to talk about how Red didn't receive Christmas toys um, or gifts, but that Addie did. And through these protections and privileges, we see, we see this clear delineation that Red isn't offered the same kind of safety that Addie is. She's not offered the same kind of safety because of what Priscilla Osen says about not being able to fit into the category of girlhood completely and to not be able to fit into a clear gendered performance of femininity that allows Addie a proximity to girlhood. So in thinking about how I might conclude or think of this um, scene as working as a whole, Red's presence on screen is really non-binary spectacle and threat. She's exiled to this non-binary space of third gender when she's unable to perform the kind of feminine costuming, stylization, and allowed the same protections as Addie. But she also is a threat in that she's willing to come back again and again, and also through her presence and constant framing on the screen. She's clearly a, an energy and force that Addie cannot get rid of easily. And this points back to the tagline of the film, we are our own worst enemy. If we don't accept Red's presence, and if we don't accept the presence of a monstrous non-binary, or even of a non-binary being, these components and these parts of ourselves will continue to come back to haunt or threaten us if we don't allow them space to be on their own. And thinking about how that fits into the larger aspect of my project and how the monster is constructed, reading non-binary gender through this film offers possibility of being. It's showing that Red allows herself to be or creates the space of non-binary and third gender through her exile. And that's great because it shows that there is this new possibility of being and reading. Except that it also shows that when she's monstrified, 
we don't have explicit representations of non-binary bodies on the screen that necessarily aren't monsters. She follows a long line of other um, monsters that are in this third gender space um, that are demonized because of their gendered space. And I think that when we think about how we represent bodies on the screen, it would be great to see more non-binary protagonists and more people who aren't monsters. We need to reconsider our questions about the possibility of embodiment and allow ourselves to redefine the parameters of our readings. This will allow to understand and allow us to interpret horror wider, but also allow us to give um, prudence and allow us to understand that these beings and existences already occur and are already here today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan, a fascinating paper. Uh, really interesting. Our next uh, presenter is Gracia Dodds. All right. Can you all see that okay? Awesome. Um, so uh, just as a quick start, um, I want to thank you all for being here. I know we're in really unprecedented times right now, um, and I think it's important to take note of that. Um, and I, it really means a lot to me that everyone that's tuning in on the live stream, um, as well as all of the other undergrad research fellows who've been doing incredible work um, under some really strange and unstable uh, timelines that we have. Um, so to start, I'm Gracia, um, and I'm a Humanities Undergrad Research Fellow, surprise, and I focused on the Southern Oregon lesbian lands. Um, so to begin, I want to talk about what those are. So as you'll see here, the lesbian lands span from Northern California to just under Eugene. Um, so we're getting pretty local with this research. Um, and these communes kind of were created as an offshoot of the Back to the Land movement um, of the 1960s and 70s. So uh, these communes were lesbian separatist uh, organizations, um, and they generally were in more rural areas. Um, and they spanned from um, small communes of about six people to up to 60. Um, so we really are understanding these communes as really diverse in the amount of people and what their aims are. Um, but a couple of things that are really unique to these communes are first, um, that they were very feminist oriented. So as an all woman commune, uh, they really wanted to focus on gender equity and understanding their roles within the communes as, egal as egal egalitarian as possible. Um, second, uh, they really wanted to look at economic equity. Um, so understanding that they were kind of separating themselves from a capitalist society and um, creating an isolationist space where they could explore other means of economic prosperity, such as socialism. So so the question I initially asked is, how did women on the lesbian lens talk about their sexuality? Um, and that's a really big question. As you can see here, um, a friend of mine responded when I was initially grappling with these questions. Uh, okay, Gracia, you're trying to solve one of the largest linguistics debates that experts don't have a clear consensus on. Um, and so I was clearly trying to answer a lot. So I decided to narrow my focus a little bit um, to understand what the term lesbian meant um, in the Southern Oregon lesbian lands from the 1960s to the 1990s. So uh, I do want to talk about methods and personal stake in the research really quickly. Um, so in terms of methods, I utilized the archives in the University of Oregon Special Collections and Archives, um, and specifically the SOCLAB Collections, which stands for the Southern Oregon Country Lesbian Archival Project. Um, so this spans, again, from the 1960s to 1999, um, which is really cool. It's a lot of time and a lot of different kinds of archival material that I got to look at. So it went from postcards to bylaws to personal journals um, to newsletters um, and everything in between and outside of those. And secondly, um, there's a lot of uh, personal stake in this research, as it turns out. So as you can see in this postcard, um, it's been being sent to Gene Mountain Grove on King Mountain Trail in Sunny Valley. Uh, before starting this project, I didn't know that anyone knew what King Mountain was except for my family. Um, my parents got married on King Mountain and they lived there uh, for quite a few years. Um, and I actually talked to my parents about this and they um, mentioned that where Jean lived was where they had electricity, but where my parents live was where they didn't. Um, and so I thought that was pretty fun. 
Additionally, um, this was sent from 744 Iowa Street in Ashland, um, and Iowa Street was a street I drove down every single day to get to high school. Um, so it was really surprising to see all of this queer history that was just right under my nose as I was getting all of this new information and research. Um, so there's a lot of hidden history in Southern Oregon that I had no idea about. So um, next I want to talk a little bit about digging in the archives um, because not only is it impactful and important, but it's also really fun. Um, as you can see here, one of the bylaws mentions that no more than nine cats on the land can be there at one time unless everyone agrees. Um, and I think this talks a lot about how, um, you know, building queer community and building um, these like little inside jokes within the queer community have spanned across decades. Um, and so this is something that the queer community might laugh about today that was also relevant back then. Um, so then we get to my findings. Uh, in terms of sexuality discourse, what I found is that from the 1960s to the early 1990s, you didn't have to be a lesbian to be a lesbian. And what I mean by that is in terms of our context of queer language now, uh, lesbianism means being solely attracted to women. However, the language that we've evolved to now in terms of understanding queer is all inclusive is kind of how lesbian was understood in the late uh, 20th century. So um, I have two contextual pieces of history that allude to this usage of lesbian as an all-inclusive term. So first off, um, there's gay liberation. So the gay liberation movement was pretty big, especially in the 1970s, um, but there was a lot of pushback from women who were in the gay liberation movement um, because they experienced misogyny unlike uh, a lot of the gay men did. Um, and so that's what led to a lot of the lesbian separatist movements because there was an intersection of both homophobia and misogyny um, that needed to be addressed that often wasn't in the gay liberation movement. Secondly, um, kind of in a similar vein, the feminist movement was really important for understanding how women could gain independence and um, separate themselves from misogynistic values and patriarchal culture. Um, however, in the feminist movement, a lot of this focused on heterosexual women. Um, so there were problems like, for example, uh, women couldn't have a credit card without a spouse or a father signing for them, or they couldn't buy property uh, without a male figure um, co-signing with them. So uh, this was a lot, uh, especially a problem for women who were only attracted to women um, because they didn't have men in their lives a lot of the time that could fill in for those roles. Um, so while the feminist movement was essential in creating that need for independence, it was also different um, because of the ways that heterosexuality functioned for women versus uh, queerness. Um, I also included uh, this title from a um, one of the National Queer Magazine's Outlook, um, and it's titled When Lesbians Fall for Men, and it's one of the most controversial uh, pieces that they published. Um, and I think this is really interesting in understanding the fluidity of this language. Um, so for women who are attracted to women in a capacity, the language that was available to them was mostly lesbian. Um, there was a lot of pushback against the term bisexual because of a plethora of stereotypes about it. Um, and so there was a really big question about the fluidity of sexuality and what it meant to be a lesbian on these lands. Um, so what I want to identify here is that um, this really portrays how language is ever evolving um, and also how language can kind of mold and fit to what we need it to be. So while we understand lesbian as something completely different now um, and we have the terminology that we do, um, lesbian also served as both a place for power and a place for risk um, in understanding who was included and excluded from that category. So lastly, um, I want to include a couple of quotes here because most of my research was um, from quotations from journals, from uh, different documents that I found, and I think that that was really cool. Um, so first off, uh, I looked at a study done by a graduate student at Southern Oregon University in Ashland, um, and when she was interviewing someone, she mentioned that, quote, when she decided to explore the heterosexual world for a time, the lesbian community turned on me. They don't accept that end quote. And I think that that really speaks to the ways that there was a lot of um, contentious ideas about what lesbian community went or what it meant and who was included and excluded from it. Um, so 
While I didn't dig necessarily into the ways that that contention played out and um, kind of what effects that had on folks who had more fluid identities, um, I did look at the women who were still on the lesbian lanes and weren't exactly sure how their uh, identity fit into the binary categories of heterosexual or lesbian. Um, the second one that I'm including um, comes from a personal journal and a woman uh, writes that it seems like the solution uh, to the dilemma of having some love for men and no time for them and I'm pleased to it with with myself. Um, and I thought that was really interesting um, because the commitment to lesbianism was not only sexual or romantic, um, but it was political. In the feminist movement, um, there was a really big push for choosing to become a lesbian um, rather than something that um, one is born into. And I think that that really speaks to the intersections of the feminist movement as well as gay liberation, particularly for women. And then this third quote um, mentions the woman was not going to say she was a lesbian because she'd been straight for three years. Um, and she grapples with the idea of like what that term could mean for her if she'd understood herself as straight for so long, um, but how she could be punished for not being straight passing. Um, and this is like the epitome of people trying to figure out where they fit in between these binaries. Um, and so I think that uh, it's so special that we have the words that we do now to describe um, that fluidity of sexuality, um, but women have been grappling with this for decades, clearly. Yeah. Lastly, um, so I included the quote that um, inspired my title. Um, so a woman talks about um, an ex-girlfriend showing up, um, no judgments, she's straight but a dyke. Uh, don't know about her and Anne maintaining, but you can never tell. Um, and it's interesting because this woman en encompassed both of these binaries um, of straight and also a dyke, which seemingly are um, juxtaposed against one another. But I think that this also speaks to the ways that they were attempting to grapple with these two categories that um, weren't just mutually exclusive, um, which I think is really interesting. Um, you'll also notice different spellings of women um, in a lot of these quotations, and that is because um, one of the big pushes against patriarchy was to change the spelling of women um, to encompass different um, understandings of what womanhood was. Um, you can also see a lot of uh, natural uh, Alter, alterations um, of these words such as we moon instead of women, um, which refers to the lunar cycle. Um, but one of the women says that they refuse to be accessible to men and they're able to take control of their own situations. So in a decade where, um, again, like you can't have a credit card on your own, you can't own property on your own, um, voting is a lot harder, stuff like that. Um, these lesbian lands provided a place for women to candidly talk about their sexuality and their own agency, um, which was really, really different from mainstream uh, patriarchal and also heterosexually dominated culture. And lastly, I'll uh, finish on this quote. Um, a woman writes in a journal, straight is what I want to be sometimes when life is rough, like standing at freeway entrances, not getting rides when police come in and take the children, when I'm just over a jealous rage and my body is spent. Actually, I do not want any of that. I could have had it. I was going to be an academic, marry another one. If we had been successful, CPS was taking women's children if they were even deemed to be considered uh, queer in some aspect, which I really think is important to highlight, um, just because it feels so far away, but it really wasn't. Um, secondly, I think that here it shows the choice that women had to make in terms of committing to these lesbian lands and committing to other women, um, because it wasn't just a personal choice or kind of a, a worrisome thing, it was a total life alteration. Um, and so I think here we can talk about the ways that language can be really, really powerful and provide community and coalition building and solidarity, um, but it can also create danger. So this um, woman had to really choose um, to do this and to commit to the lesbian lands. Um, so kind of taking these lessons that we learned from the lesbian lands into contemporary times, um, we can know that there is both um, great power and great risk in trying to create all inclusive terms. Um, and kind of taking the ways that language evolves is always going to help us make a more all inclusive community for queer folks. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gracia. Our next speaker is Tucker Engel. Excellent, thank you. All right. Put this up. All right. All 
Okay, is everyone seeing the presentation? Excellent, all right. Um, so to reiterate, um, the title of my project is The Experience of Hyper object, Objects, um, as that pertains to the romantic poetry of Percy Shelley and to the 21st century Instagram user, uh, which may in fact be many of us. So as many would have guessed, um, I'm beginning my presentation with a, a photo of the exterior of South Eugene High School. Um, you know, I, I do this because recently I was on one of my uh, routine quarantine strolls, and, and this just stood out to me, not only for its visual design, but that Latin phrase at the bottom. Um, I'm not that familiar with high schools having kind of this Latin motto, um, so I wanted to kind of deeper dive into what it meant. And, and this is certainly the most academically dubious part of my presentation, uh, translating the Latin, but after a lot of my research, I think it roughly corresponds to, um, this phrase means that the future lying in present time. Um, and once I translated that, this image really meant more to me um, because that has kind of a shocking resonance with my project. Um, what, one of the works I consulted uh, when doing this research um, was the work of economic theorist um, and kind of cultural critic, uh, Douglas Rushkoff, who in his book, Present Shock, talks about um, the way that in this current moment um, with our online experience and a lot of other factors, it appears that kind of all different time seems to collapse into a present moment. Everything is being demanded of us in the present. Um, you, you go on Twitter and, and we wanna know what you think and feel and like right now. Um, and your, your aspirations are, are less about what you wanna do in the future and, and what are you doing today? You know, we see videos on YouTube of I'm 18 years old and I just bought a house. And this is kind of the, the, the content that we're seeing is that you know, everything is kind of condensed into this present moment. Um, so that's why that, that quote stuck out to me. Um, and that transitions me into the purpose of this project. And the purpose of this project is to describe an experience um, and this experience of hyper objects um, through two different historical moments um, and, and art from those moments. Uh, the, the first is the romantic poetry of the 19th century and we'll use uh, Percy Shelley as kind of our focus to see how romantic poetry deeply concerned itself with hyper objects, with things that are kind of uh, beyond our ability to, to ascertain completely, um, as well as we'll look at how the current moment, a hyper object that we're a part of, is our digital experience, is our online presence, constantly being plugged in and engaged in kind of this digital space. Uh, and at some point, I'll probably explain what hyper objects are. I'll do that now. So what do we mean by hyper objects? Uh, before I get into uh, Timothy Morton, the theorist who, who coined and has kind of recognized that term, I'll just kind of quickly break down the word into its parts, so that might be helpful. So what do we mean by objects? Uh, well, objects are, are things and stuff. They're things and stuff or ideas that, that interact with us and that we interact with. Um, so then what is that hyper part? What, is that, what does that mean? What does that do to the objects? Well, hyper tends to kind of signify an exaggerated or an excessive state of, of the word that it's modifying. And that's definitely the case here when we think about hyper objects. So these are objects with have an exaggerated ontological scale. These are objects that their being is exaggerated um, kind of beyond what we can describe just by calling it an object. Um, and also the hyper indicates that these hyper objects exceed our ability to, to perceive them immediately. Uh, they, they, they exist beyond our immediate ability to just look at it and say that's what it is. Um, some examples that, that Morton provides of what hyper objects are might be helpful. Um, so Timothy Morton says, you know, black holes can be hyper objects. The biosphere, the kind of collective biosphere can be hyper objects. Um, collection of all of the styrofoam in the world can be a hyper object. Now, you know, having like one styrofoam cup in your hand, this isn't a hyper object. This is, this is just kind of one thing that we can look at. But thinking about the impact of the totality of styrofoam, that is kind of an entirely different thing. Um, another great example is climate change. You know, you can look out the window and perhaps you know, see a symptom of climate change, perhaps we can recognize that. But it's something that's very real and very poignant, yet it's really hard to describe what it is. It's hard to, to look and point to, there's climate change, doing the climate change stuff. It's an object that exists beyond our ability to really, um, you know, explain it simply. So that brings me to the, the poetry section, uh, the, the 19th century Percy Shelley work that we, we were consulting here. Um, because Morton, the same theorist who, who posited hyper objects, um, talks a lot about how romantic poetry um, is an expression 
of hyperobjects. Because in, in the Romantic Age of Art, um, artists took up uh, topics that were um, beyond their means to express. Um, so they were interested um, in, in, in describing things like God, like nature, or like love as such, or trying to identify the self or the subjective experience. They were taking those things up as their subject. That was kind of the spirit of their work. But again and again in Romantic poetry, we find the poet feeling this inadequacy to actually nail down what those things are. And that's ever evident in these two examples from Percy Shelley. I wish I could give more, but for the sake of time, we'll stick with these two. Um, so in Hymn to Intellectual Beauty, which you can see on the left, the very first line defines hyperobjects probably better than I tried to in the previous slide. Um, the awful shadow of some unseen power. So, so, so this line acknowledges a force, this great power that has tremendous effect, but we can't see it. We only know it through this lingering shadow that it strikes awe within us. Um, and, and later in the poem, we, we, we see that uh, you know, th this, this power visits with inconstant glance, each human heart and countenance. It, it has its effects upon everyone. Um, and, and like the clouds or, or, or like memory, um, it's, it's dearer for its mystery. So this is something that affects us and we're deeply affected by, but we can't quite explain it. And, and so without regard to how we interpret what that power is, whether Shelley's talking about God, whether Shelley's talking about um, the, the self or subjectivity, or Shelley's talking about some kind of grander, sublime sense of nature, actually doesn't matter because in any way these images convey a hyper-objective experience, an experience of a hyper-object to the romantic poet. And this is the same case in Ode to the West Wind. Um, we, you know, we see this poem about, about the West Wind, which has these powers to, to chariot seeds through, throughout kind of the world and to um, from whose unseen presence, and there's unseen again, uh, has the ability to, to drive leaves all around. Um, and you know, a, a simple reading of this is just, you know, Shelley's just talking about the wind, but it becomes clear as the poem goes on uh, that, it, that it's really much, much more profound than that. It's, it's a force that, again, is unseen and has effects beyond what we can immediately pin down. And so in, in this uh, fifth section that I cite at, at, the, at the end here in that image on the far right, um, Shelley is asking for this West Wind to make him its liar, to make him as the poet, um, ha to have the ability to express the, the nature, the essence of this wind. And, and, and again and again in his poetry, it, it's a common theme that he, he can't quite do it. You know, metaphor can get him almost there and language can get him almost there. But to, to ascertain things, hyper-objective things like this wild west wind or like the unseen power in him to intellectual beauty, he can't quite get there. And so one other thing that Morton uh, notes about romantic poetry before I move on to this slide um, is that at its core, it's trying to express an inner being or an inner experience, but has just total discomfort within language to do that. And for me, that, that just totally reminds me of my own middle school experience of having this visceral complex inner being, but not knowing how to explain it. And so that's why, you know, this film eighth grade really feels poignant um, for, for that reason alone. Um, so this film, uh, which came out in 2018, eighth grade directed by Bo Burnham, uh, it, it, it describes the, the experience of, of just a typical eighth grade girl. And what's significant about this, movie, about this movie is that she doesn't have superpowers. She's not famous. Um, in any just kind of conventional cinematic way, she's not remarkable. But what the film does is it shows how every moment in the life of an eighth grader feels totally significant. That there's actually this kind of omnisignificance to a lot of the parts of their lives. Um, the, the experience of telling your dad to drop you off a block away from the school so as not to be socially mortified. This is a, an incredibly significant experience. Um, or, or, or trying to be yourself, having people tell you to be yourself and wondering, how do I do that? How do I go to school and be myself? Or even online, which exacerbates it even more. How do I be myself on the internet? Um, or, or, or something like walking up to your crush and having the ability to talk to them. Again, this is an eighth grade experience that is absolutely significant, but maybe that one's not as particular to the eighth grade. That one might be a more universal experience. Um, but so that's what this film does so well, is it takes, it, it demonstrates how the eighth grade moment is full 
of these things that, that, that are kind of beyond our ability to comprehend them or to apprehend them exactly. And there's one scene in particular I want to point to that I think perfectly encapsulates the main hyper object that eighth grade kind of transcribes the experience of. So the, uh, the, the film, I, I think at, at its core, is talking about this hyper object of, of online consciousness, the way that we experience ourselves on the internet. And, and there's one scene that's, that's absolutely remarkable where um, you know, she's been uh, told goodnight by her father and she's, she's laying in her bed with her laptop open. And then there's this whole sequence where her screen is superimposed over this image of her looking at her laptop. So we see what the reality of, of what she's doing is, which is just looking at a screen. Then we also see the, the infinite complexity and strangeness and like kind of uncanny nature of that screen through having it kind of translucently right over her as we look. Um, so you'll see now that you know, she scrolls through a BuzzFeed quiz um, and she, she watches a Jimmy Fallon YouTube clip. And she goes on Twitter, which is an absolutely surreal combination of the thoughts of her friends, of, of uh, presidential candidates, of celebrities, and then of companies like Mountain Dew and Wendy's. All of those things are in the same place, giving her ideas and, and thoughts when it's, you know, it, it, it's time for her to actually be going to sleep. Um, <laughs> one thing that, that the director, Bo Burnham, has, has mentioned in an interview is that um, the, these kids have the choice between um, looking at the back of their eyelids at night or all of the information in the entire world, <laughs> which is just right there readily available on their device. And that's not a particular experience of those kids. I, you know, we, we face that same exact question. Um, so this is where the Frankfurt School and, and the theorist Theodore Adorno and Walter Benjamin come into play for me. Uh, because as my project looked at the way that the media that we consume, the, this online digital experience, the, the lives that we live on there, how they greatly affect who we are as subjects how this deep hyper object we interact with shifts the way that we kind of know ourselves and can make our way through the world. Um, that, that's quite resonant with some of the work that, that Benjamin and Adorno do on, on the way that culture and, and the cultural artifacts that we consume impact us. Um, there's one work where Walter Benjamin is talking about uh, technological reproducibility. And he's talking about the shift from, from painting to photography as, as the mode of art and how that would radically change uh, the, the way that the art is produced, but also the way that people act and behave and, and know themselves through seeing art happen in photos. And then with motion film, that there's this kind of more of this drive to, to act a certain way or to, to be a celebrity in that thing. And if only he were here to see Snapchat um, or, or TikTok, I, I think that we would see that the theory is still true, that the media with which we're engaging with really changes the way that we process art process ourselves and, and big questions like that and 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 ultimately the huge conglomeration of media that that we find ourselves with now which is far beyond just snapchat just TikTok, it's beyond just what we even find you know through social media it, it is too comprehensive to explain you know we can look at one part of it just like that cup of styrofoam and say there it is right there but the totality of it the totality of how we're embedded into the, this hyper object of any kind of online consciousness is beyond simple explanation. Okay, so now we'll get to the most easy question of the project, which is why does it matter? Um, like what, still, what do we mean when we're, when we're talking about hyper objects and, and why is this relevant? Um, and so first I wanna answer how the concept of hi the hyper object is relevant to the poetry that I've talked about and to our experience today of, of an Instagram mega scroll or a a YouTube deep dive or Wikipedia rabbit hole. Um, and, and, and they're similar and, it, and it's super relevant to talk about it in terms of hyper objects uh, because they're things that we're deeply immersed in and have profound effect on us and it kind of are always there in the back of our mind, yet we feel totally inadequate in, in perfectly describing it. Um, you know, you'll, you'll spend an hour on Wikipedia and somebody asks you what you did or what you learned and it's hard to even come up with anything because you did so much all at once. Um, and so that's why this concept of hyper objects is important to bring up here because it is a concept for these things that are a little bit beyond our ability to represent artistically. So what, what can we do? And I think the best effort that we can make, and this is kind of the, the, the thesis or what I'm positing with my project is that we can 
try our best to attune to hyper objects by looking at them as I have bridging them historically, looking at how have we done it in the past artistically? How have, how have romantic poets tried to grasp these concepts in the past? So things like nature or the self, um, you know, what, what is the attempt uh, to, to grasp what they mean? And, and are there new things or the same questions that are, that are in our lives? And can we authentically represent them by being vulnerable and admitting what we don't know and, and trying to, to see how, how those things might be affecting us without full knowledge of what, what they are. Um, and, and the final point I wanna make is in, in, in reference to uh, just the way in which the, the internet um, uh, can, can really change our, our current moment um, is that the self that we're forming, whether we're in the eighth grade or if we're a senior in college or you know, a professor in college, um, it really has, has a change in, in the way that it forms kind of an ontological um, knowledge of itself when its reference points shift from looking out at the wind and leaves and, and things like that that we might see in Shelley to finding itself bewildered by a BuzzFeed quiz or by the Twitter feed. Um, the experience is different, but both are, are incredibly difficult to articulate in just a, a few matter of words. And I think even acknowledging that is worth doing. Great. Uh, well, well, thank you all for your attention, and, and thank you especially to everyone who supported this project. Thanks, Tucker. Our next speaker is uh, Daisy Berge. There we go. Hello. I'm just going to share. sharing. All right. For my project, um, I'm examining the ideas of the incomplete or defective male. Um, and this primarily centers from a quote from Aristotle's On Generation of Animals, in which he describes the differences in sex between the male and the female. Um, and this really highlights ideas of what femaleness was and its relationship to maleness and to control, which is sprinkled throughout classical medical and philosophical texts. So I really began this project by noticing in ancient texts this treatment of women, and it didn't confuse me so much as slightly enrage me. <laughs> and for me, I wanted to examine how ideas of sexual difference manifested in classical Greek medical texts and philosophical texts, and sort of how those two bodies of knowledge intersected to create an idea of womanhood that the Greeks predicated a lot of their social understandings and social policies off of. Um, so this really highlights two questions for me of how these ideas of sexual difference influence how womanhood is constructed and uh, how women are understood to exist in a natural world the Greeks really do understand themselves as a part of this natural world and as a part of the animal kingdom. So I think it's really important to sort of understand in context that womanhood and nature, just as maleness and nature, are two really, really um, strong ideas in medical and philosophical texts. So immediately upon asking this question about sexual difference, a lot of historiographies collide. Uh, general classics historiography, which has existed for centuries, uh, basically ever since we have exited out of the classical antiquity period. Um, and then of course, an ancient science historiography of uh, many of the scientific works that I'm examining, including the Hippocratic Corpus and Aristotle's On Generation of Animals. Um, I will be 
discussing these two sources in particular in just a moment. But I really want to highlight here in this historiography is this question of women in classical antiquity, because women have been excluded in this study of classical antiquity from positions of academic authority for centuries. And it hasn't been until the mid 20th century that women's history within curriculum has been added to uh, classical studies. And it hasn't been until recent decades that women have actually achieved academic positions of authority. Both of these really significantly impact our study of womanhood when it comes to the classical world, because the truth is, is that a lot of the secondary literature has significant gaps or it contradicts itself. And this is the result of there not being a clear consensus. And the reason why there is not a clear consensus is because women in academic studies have been systematically ignored. And this is one of the things that I really appreciate about this research fellowship is that so many people have chosen to highlight topics of gender and of sex and uh, of problems concerning the human body. I think that it's really great that academics are finally examining and acknowledging this. And I think that in classical studies in particular, a lot of work needs to be done. Because of the state of a lot of secondary analysis, I had to be very careful in choosing my secondary sources. And I primarily relied on primary source analysis of three works. The Hippocratic Corpus, which is a compendium of medical works from the Hippocratic School of Medicine, which uh, was on the Isle of Kos, off of the Turkish mainland, um, from the 5th and 4th century BCE. The reason why I utilize the Hippocratic Corpus is because it is one of the largest compendium of medical works that we still understand um, from the classical period, and also because it's been highly influential in ideas of medicine for centuries afterwards. The medieval period had for uh, centuries explicit mentions of the Hippocratic Corpus. Humoral medicine, which rose actually from the Hippocratic Corpus, was considered to be scientific consensus until the 1600s. I will also be looking at Aristotle's On the Generation of Animals, which is a part of Aristotle's larger series of zoological writings, um, which include information specifically on embryology and the principles of human regeneration. Aristotle's work takes an explicitly teleological approach, meaning that he examines things as a sliding scale. The analogy that I like to give is an oak seed is the potential and an oak tree is its final cause or its teleological purpose, if you will. If you have a potentiality to achieve, that is your telos or your teleology. Now, Aristotle's approach to sexual difference and its teleological approach is really important to understanding sexual difference because the Hippocratic corpus, while it disagrees with a lot of the medical understandings that Aristotle has on sexual difference, they both employ a teleological approach to womanhood, which really emphasizes fertility and pregnancy, motherhood, and childbirth. The last work that I will be examining is Aristotle's Politics, which translates to things of the polis. And this really describes ideal manifestations of public life. So my central questions from this initial reading are what the implications of scientific and medical knowledge are when they converge on ideas of sexuality and how this really establish and affects power relations in ancient Greece. I really wanted to understand how binaries in particular reinforce and recreate ideas of sexual difference. So my findings were honestly a bit disturbing for me, but they were also really informative in understanding how understandings of the female body have really evolved over time. Because Greek medical literature really saw unchecked female sexual development or female puberty as a medically hazardous process. Male sexual involvement was seen as something that was actually integral to the process of her development into womanhood. And female sexual rep reproduction was considered biologically and medically desirable. In other words, it was considered part of the natural order by Aristotle, but it was also considered to be medically healthy by, Hippoc 
by Hippocrates. So what primarily sexually differentiates women from men and at the same time proves them to be inferior is that their telos involves male sexual involvement. They have to have sexual intercourse to become pregnant, medically healthy, and naturally fulfilled. So motherhood and pregnancy is the teleology of womanhood. Now, I want to start with the basic Greek understanding of the female anatomy because it is quite different from the modern era. Paola Minulli in, the, in 1980 introduced an idea to Hippocratic gynecological um, medicine of the hodos or the vaginal canal. And this idea is that a canal extends from the orifices of the head down the throat, connecting to the uterus, the cervix, the vaginal canal, and down to the labia so that there is one continuous tube or canal um, from the top of the head down. Much like the intestines, which are extremely long, the idea of a very long tube within the human body means that things can get obstructed, displaced, etc. I want to highlight this modern picture of what we understand the female reproductive system to be. While it is this small, in the graph, it is about four to five times that size in this sort of Greek understanding. And ergo, it could be medically hazardous in this view for women to develop unchecked because of issues that could arise from that long of a tube. Virginity was seen as a medical hazard because uh, this had the ability to become blocked or obstructed. When menstruation begins, menarche, uh, blockage is more likely to occur because there is a menstrual residue which is trying to pass through the vaginal canal. So the conclusion is that the best time to have sex is as soon as possible as after your first menstrual cycle. Hesiod in Works in Days says that you are at the right age to bring a wife into your house when you are not much less than 30 and your wife should be four years past puberty and marry to you in the fifth. What this resulted in was a lot of marriages in the classical era were between men who were around the age of uh, 30 and women who were anywhere between 16 and 19 to 20. One of the medical um, issues that could arise that I would really like to highlight that really highlights this idea of the hodos or the vaginal canal is this idea of wandering womb. Dissection wasn't considered to be medically um, practicable because it was a huge taboo up until the third century. So before dissection, it was believed that a woman's womb was not actually attached by ligaments to the pelvic cavity. The womb was believed to float in place. And under normal conditions, i.e. regular sexual involvement with a man, the womb would be balanced because it receives moisture from the male seed and everything is weighted down with an embryo. But it could become unbalanced or dry without the sexual involvement, seeking the womb to seek moisture from other organs in the body wandering around. This resulted in a sort of bumper car where the womb would place pressure on other organs and many other diseases could result. It could result in infertility, pain in the abdomen, and in other cases could result in death. This is the point that I really want to highlight within the Hippocratic corpus. Another point about women, if they have sexual intercourse with men, their health is better than if they do not. For in the first place, the womb is moistened by intercourse, whereas the womb is drier, that it should become extremely contracted, and this causes pain to the body. I think that it's really important to highlight how medically necessary it was seen uh, for women to actually be involved sexually with men. So this brings up this question of why women are designed like this. Is it not a design flaw in women? Well, Aristotle argues no, for species have to reproduce in order to maintain their stay on the planet. The teleology of woman makes sense because it's the only way to regenerate the species. Women must reproduce to be healthy and they must reproduce to fulfill their purpose. Women are a means to an end. They are a necessary evil in mammalian reproduction. Mammals require a vital heat. They are warm-blooded, according to Aristotle. And 
one of the ways to cultivate this vital heat is through sexual difference. Higher forms of animal have sexual difference, according to Aristotle, and this vital heat is required to regenerate mammalian higher form life. Therefore, women are required to bring forth other mammals. Human reproduction, therefore, is a part of the natural order. Women must have sex to be healthy. They have the power to generate within themselves, to gestate a child. And surely this power is meant to be exercised. Reproduction was seen as something that was incredibly powerful and incredibly important, especially because life expectancy in the classical era was incredibly uncertain in a lot of areas and regions. Warfare and environmental causes made it very difficult for a lot of uh, babies to grow to be full adults. Regeneration was a means to preserve the human legacy. It's a biological necessity and women have a vital role. Now, to conclude, I really want to highlight how in social literature, women are seen similarly. They are seen as a part of um, they are seen as a part of a society where they do not have enough authoritative reason to understand how important their regenerative properties are. Therefore, they have to have sexual intercourse with a man, whether they want to or not. Strict control of women's reproductive processes are medically necessary and socially necessary. They fulfill a woman's natural cause, a woman's teleology. It's sexually and it's medically necessary for these women to procreate in this view. And they have to make themselves sexually available to men. I really want to highlight here that there is an important in institutions of knowledge production and how this affects social relationships and the way in which philosophical and medical literature conceived of women were that they were in essence, defective. They had to generate within themselves. They did not have the power to generate within others. And therefore they had to fulfill their final cause of becoming a mother. So I would like to thank everybody so much. And um, I would especially like to thank my advisor, Professor Lindsay Masaryk. I would also like to thank all of my friends and family who have been really, really supportive and really integral to this entire process. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Daisy. Our final panelist is Momo Wilms Crow. Cool. Hi, everyone. And I'm going to share my screen. Um, all right. Can everyone see that? Awesome. OK. And I have a timer going, so <laughs> I'll make sure that I'm within our time because I know we're running a bit short. Uh, so as I mentioned before, the title of my project is This de Abajo Como Semilla. Puerto Rican food sovereignty as embodied decolonial resistance. Um, and in this project, I am using food as a site of study to examine both the impacts of colonialism and then also contemporary mechanisms of resistance to it. Uh, and this was done through ethnographic fieldwork. So I spent the summer, this past summer, um, on the island of Puerto Rico. Uh, and through the stories that I collected, um, I'm hoping to explain how Puerto Ricans are cultivating a really radical transformation um, of both their lived realities, uh, and then also creating community self-determination through a wide range of food product projects, um, widely under the banner of food sovereignty, we'll I'll talk about more later. And as a political scientist, um, my interest in this project is really um, on food practices, not just as cultural practices, but as profoundly political practices, which I'll talk a lot more about. And I think food specifically is a really interesting point of analysis when thinking about how we engage politically because it's something we all do every day yet we don't really think of that as a means of political agency or political activism but i hope by the end of this we might have other ideas on that and then just briefly on the title so this de abajo como semilla is um, in spanish and it means from below like a seed and it's the uh, kind of catchphrase of one of the local community gardens that I was working really closely with. And I think it really captures the essence of kind of the movement that I was spending a lot of time with, which is very much grassroots from below and also very generative in kind of the future and contemporary reality that it is creating through the practices. 
So just really quickly before I begin, I wanted to do a quick land acknowledgements, which I know feels a bit weird since we are not all in the same place um, and we're operating in this digital sphere right now. But I think in any conversation, it's really important to ground ourselves in where we're located, especially in a conversation about colonialism. Um, so personally, I'm in Eugene, which is historically Kalapuya traditional territory and is now represented by the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde and the Siletz Indians. Um, so I'm not sure where everyone who's joining this conversation is located, but I encourage everyone to look into that because um, I think it's important to recognize that colonialism isn't something of the past and that we're all um, inherently implicated in it just by nature of our engagement with our material realities, which includes the land that we are on. So with that, um, also, this is really beautiful. That's from Mount Pixa a few weeks ago. Um, I've been really enjoying getting out hiking during COVID because it's been really weird. Uh, let's see, trying to change slides. Oh, one back. Okay, so the research question that guided me through this project was how do Puerto Rican communities view and use food as decolonial resistance in the struggle for a radically no, new socio-political reality? And in asking this question, um, I'm looking less kind of into the theoretical discourse around what it means to decolonize, especially in the Puerto Rican context, which gets really complicated based on kind of the political um, relationship with the US. But I'm really trying to look more at grassroots action um, that I'm characterizing as decolonial and how through this action and through this mechanism of engagement with the food system, people are really radically transforming the conditions on the ground um, in ways that I find really political and really significant in the contemporary conversation around climate justice and social justice um, and community resilience, uh, especially in the crisis context, which I think has increased urgency with COVID. And it's been really exciting to um, watch my other presenters because I think my research really builds on some of the conversations that have been having with Gracia's and Ryan's presentation specifically um, around queerness as an especially powerful framework for kind of pursuing alternative possibilities and looking beyond these binaries, um, which in my context, I'll talk about monoculture, but I think we can talk about kind of that in the cultivation of food, but also in our kind of cultural monoculture, right? Um, so pushing against these binaries and kind of these normative frameworks for what is uh, a certain way of being and existing in our world. So it's been exciting to see how our projects are all intersecting a bit. So a note on my methods. Um, I really appreciated what was just said about knowledge production as a profoundly political process. Cause I think, especially in doing ethnographic work where I'm working directly with communities that are not necessarily my own. Um, it's really important to think about kind of the power dynamics at play and how we engage in the process of knowledge production in a way that's very attuned to these dynamics of specifically extractivism. Um, I think academia is <laughs> uh, very much caught up in this process of colonial extractivism. And I think in doing knowledge production and um, thinking about how we as researchers engage with communities, it's really important to just have those dynamics in mind, especially as um, a white researcher from the continental US, that was definitely on my mind. Um, so I was very much approaching this project with wanting to give back and make it as participatory and as gauging um, and reciprocal as possible with the communities that I work with. Uh, and kind of my process follows generally three main um, categories. So first and foremost, as a researcher, I'm a listener. Um, this means that I am going into communities uh, as a participant observation. I'm going to as many events as possible. I'm doing formal interviews. So through the course of my research, I did formal interviews with 14 um, different community members who were a range of chefs and farmers and students and activists and community members all engaging with the food system in some capacity. Uh, and it was really amazing to hear their stories and hopefully transmit them out. I'm also translating and that could be literal. Uh, I'm translating from Spanish to English. In many cases, my interviews were done in Spanish, um, but I'm also seen translating as between spheres that may not normally be in contact with one another. So between an activist space and academia and then also academia and activist spaces and wider populations, which um, I think all of those connections are really important, but often overlooked. And then I also see translation in kind of my work in the interdisciplinary space. So I'm a political scientist, but draw a lot on critical theory, um, mainly from indigenous thought and then kind of anarchist radical thought, and then also in feminist and queer theory. So 
those uh, theoretical foundations might not necessarily be talking to each other directly, um, but I think they all have really important things to say, especially in the context of food sovereignty. So I'm hoping that um, by bringing these different kind of theoretical uh, approaches together in my literature review, I'm showing how there's a really a lot to be said in conversation between them. And then lastly, I see myself as a storyteller. Um, I'm trying to express these stories that I feel like have been much overlooked, um, but hold really great salience and relevance for the contemporary world and all the kind of struggles that we're facing um, as a collective society. And the way that I do my storytelling is very intentional. Um, I pulled this quote, which is something that I overheard in one of my um, field study. I went to this um, community assembly and this woman stood up and said that PR, Puerto Rico is called poor, but Puerto Rico is rico, which means rich. Rico en amor, rich in love, rico en valor, rich in bravery, rico en resistencia, rich in resistance. I think the way that this frames it with this assets-based approach is really important for me because the way that I talk about agency, um, I'm very much talking about these large systems of inequality and structural power imbalance, but really I'm trying to locate power at the grassroots um, and kind of reframe when we're talking about agency or political engagement. So I hope that in my storytelling, um, I don't intend to be neutral. Um, I'm definitely bringing my activist agenda um, to this, and I hope that that just informs this project and makes it um, richer rather than challenging it or threatening it as a piece of academic work. Um, which also, I should mention that I'm also um, very much engaged with local food systems here. Um, I work with farmers markets and chefs and an activist myself, so I approach this also as a fellow food justice worker, so that informs this project. Okay, so just some brief baseline understandings that I'm not going to go into too detail, but if you're interested, I'm welcome to send you my full paper. Um, colonialism is an ongoing structure, not an event of the past. Hopefully that goes without saying. Um, colonialism is inherently connected to cis heteropatriarchy, racial capitalism, and modernity. So we see these multiple systems overlapping and informing each other and really reinforcing them. Um, which also makes certain decolonial work especially potent, which is where I talk a lot about queer decolonial work because it gets at many of these systems. And then violence against the land and ecology is directly connected to violence against human bodies. Um, and I think this is really important to understand that the same kind of systems that deem certain bodies um, extractable or render them disposable does the same kind of logic when it comes to certain land. Um, and that's when we see American biopower has created these um, legacies of extractivism <clears throat> very consistently across the land and the body. Um, so in my project title, I talk about embodiment. And when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about kind of our literal physical embodiment with how we engage with food, but also um, our social relations, so our body politic, and then also the earth body, which is like this third body that I'm kind of consistently referencing. So there's these tiered intersecting bodies, and I think colonialism has um, had very violent impacts across all three, which is why the work that I'm highlighting um, is also especially significant in doing really important healing work across all three. And um, just a brief note on that. So I think the connection um, between land and human body in Puerto Rico is very visible if we look at a history um, of US engagement. So we see that um, Puerto Rican women were the basically test control subjects for um, the tests, the trials of the, the pill, the birth control pill, um, which is when US women refused to be part of the trials because the side effects were so bad, um, they shifted their studies to Puerto Rico where the women didn't have options to um, not take part in that. And we also see that there has been um, a lot of really toxic military testing done on islands in Puerto Rico. So we see similarly where um, it's been kind of this testing site for US imperial projects, um, which, yeah. And then lastly, um, this dynamic of colonialism, while it is not formally recognized um, according to the UN and the US of course doesn't refer to the US or to Puerto Rico as a colony, it's reinforced very directly through the legal and political infrastructure. And those are just a few um, legal and political codes and policies that very much reinforce this dynamic 
and La Junta, which you see on the stop sign. So at the stop sign, it says stop La Junta. Um, that's in reference kind of a colloquial term to the fiscal control board, which was established under PROMESA um, to manage the Puerto Rican debt. And that is all undemocratically elected. Um, so basically, no Puerto Ricans do not have any control over the policies that are impacting their lived realities. Uh, and then just below that is a photo from a protest, which was about land policies. So um, based on some of the corporate tax codes, which is the IRS section 936, uh, foreign corp or American based corporations can be in Puerto Rico and they pay no taxes on their profits, <laughs> which means that in Puerto Rico, there's the highest uh, proportion of Walgreens and Walmarts. And we see that it's really easy for foreign and American corporations and capital to come in and take land that then Puerto Ricans themselves don't have access to. So land and land cultivation is really central in this process of colonialism. Um, cool. So I was there this past summer, which just Warren speaking to really briefly. Um, hopefully you saw some of the news that it was a very exciting time to be there. This is something that I wasn't expecting to show up in the middle of what became um, some of the biggest protests that the world had seen. We had millions of people show up to the streets um, in speaking out against what was first just the governor, Ricky Rosseo, who was eventually ousted. Um, but it was much more a critique of kind of the status quo and the circumstances of colonialism and a really big moment in terms of a political awakening of this is what people can do when they show up to the streets in collection um, and resist these dynamics. And I think it was clear that there are multiple overlapping social and political and ecological crises um, crises that are occurring at Puerto Rico. Um, but then the question is, how do we resolve these crises and what avenues are open for seeking change? And I think it's very clear that the formal political structures are not open to Puerto Ricans who want to seek change. So that means that people are looking both outside and also beyond the state um, to seek some of the solutions that would provide some kind of um, some kind of at least temporary, but hopefully long-term solutions to the type of vast inequality and suffering that is occurring. So these are two quotes that I pulled from interviews that I did. Um, the first one from Lorena, this revolution is going to be very como que bien comunitario y independiente del gobierno. So it has to be very community-based and independent from the government. So they really, um, Lorena didn't see kind of the formal state politics as being where she's looking to create change. It's um, very much outside of that because that offers her nothing. And then Gabby, similarly, uh, I don't have faith in the government. I have energy to work. So I think this really captures um, the energy that most of the people that I work with um, brought to the way that they're engaging politically. So in my thesis, I talk about food as political agency. Um, and I think this is really important to think about food because I think it has the power to create agency um, through what it allows us to do with working the land um, or cultivating or cooking food, but also it reframes our subjectivity by creating pride. Um, and I think in doing that, it really supports um, this larger process of resisting these dominating and exploiting systems of power. Uh, so the projects that I looked at were mainly community um, garden projects, but I also looked at some farm to table restaurants, spoke with chefs and then farmers markets. So other ways that local food systems are really being um, wrapped into this larger conversation around decolonial um, resistance and just resistance to US kind of hegemonic political control. And what was clear that this work was very much resistance to this dynamic of US extractivism and also created local um, uh, autonomy in a way that resisted this legacy of dependency on U.S. markets and U.S. food systems, which is really significant because um, that has been historically a way that the U.S. has uh, maintained this control over Puerto Ricans was through kind of the forced importation of U.S. food products. So by cultivating their own food, um, this is very much changing conditions and creating local power in very su substantial ways. And there's one quote that I wanted to pull. This is from Cristal, who's pictured here on the right in my photo. And uh, she says, if we as communities and as individuals are able to control what we eat, I feel like we are definitely changing our social, our everything. 
if you do it in community more and less as an individual, then you're creating a big social change. So I feel like if we're able to be sovereign of what we eat, we could change a lot of things. And to me, this spoke to this way that food really paves the way for a larger political imagination and opens up a lot of possibilities of what we can demand of each other, of our communities, um, and ultimately of our government. And I think I also just kept seeing in my research how the food work that I was looking at really is fueling this larger political process. Um, so in some ways, this is literally where a local community organization um, fed protesters at the, all the strikes this summer. So that's very literal. But then I think also um, in talking to humanities people who need about kind of the cultural significance of this, I spoke to one chef who particularly talking about um, using farm to table and really honoring local food traditions in Puerto Rico um, is resisting this process of culinary imperialism. So I think it's really key to see how food is much a part of this political process of resistance and cultivating local resilience in the face of some really harmful systems. And then to end, I just wanted to come back to the current moment. As Gracia mentioned, we're living in kind of unprecedented times. And I think um, one thing that's been in some ways exciting about the COVID moment has been how relevant my research is. So much of my research was based in the post Maria context. So we saw this hugely disastrous crisis that radically uh, shifted food systems and just people's understanding of what it meant to be in community and what it meant to exist. Um, in a context that was increasingly very fragile. And this was from my field notes this past summer. Uh, I said, as crumbling in reference to kind of the normality and the social structure, community is coming together, tolerance for second swear bullshit uh, is going down and creativity and belief in new solutions is going up. I think we're also very much seeing this in the current moment um, where we're living in this crisis moment, but it's also incredibly transformative and we're really having to reprioritize what matters and focus on what uh, what we need, which I think comes down to the basic necessities, right? Like food and community. So I think in this context, um, it's especially important to look towards communities that have gone through crisis and come out even more resilient and more regenerative. So this just to me speaks to the profound significance of looking toward communities like Puerto Rico in this current moment, because I think the food work happening there is really amazing and how it's creating greater democracy, um, kind of directly grassroots democracy, and also greater social, economic, um, and ecologic justice, and then also really these deep structural healing, which is really important. Um, and also, I know it's we just it's been election season, right? Uh, we just voted, hopefully. Um, but I think it's important to realize that there's so many ways of engaging politically besides just the formal electoral system. So I hope that as we're trying to create change in whatever way that we do see as community members, um, we remember that there's really so many ways to engage. Um, and I think in this moment where the world is facing huge issues like climate change and rising inequality, we really all do have the power to create change um, in really local and substantive ways that still matters. So that's just my last kind of call to action to everyone listening, um, because I think we all hold a lot more power if we are willing to, to claim it. Um, yeah, and I'd also just like to thank everyone who's fueled this project, both from my advisors um, to my neighbors. This is a picture of a food box that one of my neighbors dropped off the other week um, with some strawberry starts and asparagus. So I think everyone who's been part of this project has meant so much to me. So I really just wanna offer gratitude, including to everyone um, who's watching and then also the other fellows on this. It's been really amazing to work with you all. So thank you and I'll stop sharing. Thanks Momo. Um, I'm so sorry to say that we're totally out of time. Please join me in thanking these incredible uh, humanities undergraduate research fellows for their fascinating papers. I hope you'll tune in to the other live stream panels over the course of the day and make sure not to miss the 1 p.m. panel. Pans and clicks are mightier than the sword on which the two remaining her fellows are presenting their work. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, panelists. Fantastic work. It's been such a pleasure. Thanks, I didn't see that last one.